Some of my favorite digital audio players are old and cheap. For example, the Fio X3, Ibasso DX50, DX80, and DX90, and Astro and Kern AK100 Mark II used to cost several hundreds of dollars, but you can find them on eBay for about a hundred bucks these days. I also have many modern DAPs such as the Fio M15, KN6 Mark II, KN3 Pro, Astro and Kern ConCube, and the Sony NWZX507. All of these players work just fine, and there are a few different features between them. But the issue I see when I compare my older DAPs to the newer products is that very little actually changes. Yes, all of these products have different DACs, but they also have very similar power outputs and similar playback functionality. The N3 Pro has a miniature tube, the N6 Mark II can swap out amp boards, and the Con Cube is just huge. Other than marginal alterations in physical design, upgrades to the newest DACs, and ever-increasing price tags, modern DAPs simply have little to offer to justify their outrageous prices. But along comes QLS, a Chinese manufacturer. They released a new DAP that was designed on a totally different premise from every other digital audio player in the market. I am talking of the QA390. I got my QA390 from Apple's Audio about one year ago. So, is the 390 a worthwhile investment or a waste of money? Whenever I discuss products from a relatively small brand, I like to talk about their qualifications. After all, the last thing we want is to pay a ton of money to a company that might disappear tomorrow. QLS is a Chinese brand that has been selling high-end audio gear for many years. They have a few portable digital audio players, stereo amp, and power supplies. QLS likes to keep things fairly simple. Their products are heavy, machined aluminum. Most of their product line looks industrial. The company seems to support its products. Indeed, they have a whole page of firmware updates and manuals for their various products, including the QA390. You can buy QLS products from Amazon, eBay, AliExpress, and Apple's Audio. Like I said, I got my 390 when I purchased it from Appos, which is an authorized reseller. In short, although you may not have heard of QLS amongst the cacophony of branding from Fio, Astro and Kern, Hibby, and Ibasso, rest assured, QLS is an established brand. QLS promises that the 390 is an all-in-one solution, a powerful DAP for both mobile and desktop use. They say that the player is quiet due to its isolated power supply and low noise circuitry. The 390 is supposed to drive even high impedance headphones, supports all forms of audio formats, and also has all to DSD functionality. The 390 has the ability to connect to a PC or Mac as a DAC. It can connect to a mobile device such as phones. It has Bluetooth, which supports only two codecs, LHDC and AAC. The 390 has Bluetooth 5.0. With all these features, QLS says that the 390 is aimed towards professionals and enthusiasts. Their website states that the 390 is suitable for those who go on quote frequent business trip, participation in various parties, events, offices, homes, study, living room, bedside, and other enthusiasts with mobile needs. End quote. So basically, QLS thinks their player is for everyone. Some of the suggested uses for the 390 are a bit confusing. Here's a quote that has me baffled. Quote, if your desktop system is sometimes nice, sometimes not good, one sounding during the day, another sounding in the middle of the night, or a good period of a time and not good for a while, it proves that the electrical environment has a great influence on the sound of your system, completely immune to electricity. The QA390 for environmental impact must be tried. End quote. What the hell does this mean? The Enigma code was easier to crack than this one statement. After reviewing the marketing material and the manual, I can summarize what QLS is trying to convey. In essence, QLS thinks that the 390 is for every type of audiophile. This product is supposed to be the jack of all trades. That is, it is supposed to do everything that would otherwise take several products to accomplish. The basic idea, instead of spending money every few years on upgrading to another DAP or desktop stack, the 390 allegedly does it all. Well, not all. QLS makes clear that the product is not portable, so nearly everything, I suppose. 
QLS says that the 390 is, quote, a movable desktop player and an all-in-one machine. When they say movable desktop player, they mean exactly that. The 390 is not a portable player by any stretch of the imagination. The 390 is jam-packed with electronics, fast charging batteries, 30 power chips, capacitors, transistors, six headphone jacks, and two AK4497 DACs. The 390 has an OLED screen, but it is not touchscreen. On the left side, there is a full-sized SD card slot. That's because the 390 is also a music transport. In other words, you can insert your SD card full of music and use this as ahem, a movable player. Unfortunately, the 390 does not support hard disk mode. You cannot plug your SD card into the 390, then plug your 390 into your computer and access the files on the SD card that way. I have no doubt that this feature could be implemented with a simple firmware update, but as for now, neither Windows nor Mac sees the QLS as a storage device. There's no option in the settings to turn the 390 into a storage device. The 390 has six headphone outputs, as I just mentioned. Balanced XLR, 2.5mm balance, 3.5mm balance, 4.4mm balance, single-ended quarter-inch, and single-ended 3.5mm are all on the front panel. The player literally has every headphone connection type. The front panel also houses the large volume knob. This knob turns smoothly, but does have incremental clicks. There are two switches on the front as well. One is to turn the player on and off. The other is to select whether you want the 390 to charge from the DC power input. The back panel is equally feature rich. The 390 has balanced XLR output, an RCA output, one coaxial digital input, one coaxial digital output, optical out, optical in, micro USB input to connect to mobile devices, a USB-C for fast charging, a DC input for DC charging, and a computer USB-B. Whew. The top panel houses the screen and seven buttons for navigation. The 390 also comes with a remote, and this is the best remote of any device I have ever seen. It is heavy, made of aluminum, and actually comes with a battery pre-installed, which is something you rarely see these days. The remote will be necessary to switch inputs, however. For some strange reason, the top panel navigation will not allow you to select inputs if an SD card is inserted. If you eject the SD card, the player will allow you to select input. However, the remote will let you select input whether an SD card is inserted or not. I found this to be a little strange since the input selection feature should be part of the top panel navigation, if for no other reason than for redundancy. The 390 has superb build. Nearly everything that I can touch and see is made of metal. The knob is metal, the switches are metal, the entire casing is metal. The only non-metal components are the buttons and the screen. The 390 is a heavy beast as well. The player weighs about 4 pounds, so you better have some arm strength and a sturdy platform. Out of curiosity, I asked QLS if it was possible to plug multiple headphones into the 390 all at once. I got a three-word response. No problem, thanks. Upon further clarification, QLS said that there would be no problems using multiple headphones at once as long as the total impedance of all headphones in parallel is not less than 10 ohms. So, I experimented. I plugged in my Aventone Planar to the 4.4mm balanced, the HD560S into the 3.5mm single-ended, and the HD58X into the quarter-inch single-ended, all at once. All of these headphones have different impedances and sensitivities. I initially listened on the planar, then plugged in the other two headphones one by one. The planar did not decrease in volume as the other two headphones were connected. The planar did not increase volume when I unplugged the other two headphones. If you intend to do A-B tests, the 390 would be a good platform for that scenario. QLS also has speakers covered. The 390 can connect to passive speakers as easily as it does to powered speakers. Overall, I think that the build is robust, sturdy, and quite frankly, premium. Although I would prefer a touchscreen, the menu navigation on the 390 is simple, fast, and intuitive. The assortment of features is unique and, as far as I know, found only on this device. In order to test the sound signature of the 390, I used various headphones to get a baseline impression. 
I listened with my Aventone Planar, Allo S4X, HD560S, and Denon D2000. Now there was a specific reason I chose each of these headphones, and give me a moment to explain. The Planar and S4X are the most neutral headphones I have ever heard. However, both have some minor issues. The Planar, for example, has a sub-bass roll-off, but otherwise neutral presentation. The S4X has a neutral bass, but a marginal emphasis in sibilance and treble. The HD560S has a considerably sibilant spike, particularly for female vocalists. The D2000 is a bassy headphone that melds sub-bass and mid-bass, but is just short of becoming boomy. I wanted to find out if the QA390 has a bass emphasis. If it does, then I should hear some different presentation from the planar. And if the 390 boosts mid-bass, then the D2000 should become boomy. If the 390 emphasizes sibilance and treble, then the S4X should start to sound harsh. And if the sibilance is significantly emphasized, then the 560 should be unbearable. Keep in mind that my reviews are built upon concepts and tests. If you're wondering how the test headphones in this review sound, please watch the reviews for those products. For this listening test, I put the 390 into maximum output mode. That is, I selected high gain with high voltage. I played music while connected to my PC and the 390 in DAC mode. I used my test playlist from Amazon Music HD. All headphones in this test became comfortably loud and never required maxing out the volume pot. The general impression for sound is this. The 390 is neutral. There is no audible emphasis in any part of the frequency range. The Aventone's sub-bass roll-off was unchanged. In Mountains by Hans Zimmer, the planar displayed the low rumble at the beginning of the song, but that rumble was fast and underemphasized. On the S4X, the rumble did not sound rolled off or emphasized. Mid-bass impact seemed neutral as well. In songs like Conquer and Irodori, both the S4X and Planar performed as if they were on neutral sources such as the Drop 789 and the RME ADI-2 DAC. Indeed, in back and forth comparisons between the RME and the QA390, I heard no differences whatsoever in drum strikes, decay, or timbre when using the testing headphones. Subwoofer effects found in hip-hop songs were also unaltered on the Planar and the S4X. In other words, the 390 did not roll off or emphasize subwoofer effects. As I listened to the D2000, I noticed no bloom in the bass, no distortion, and no difference in presentation than how the D2000 performs on neutral sources. Mids on the 390 are also neutral. The timbre of all instruments sounds correct. Female sibilance on the planar was neutral. On the S4X, it was slightly emphasized, and on the HD560S, it was fairly harsh. This is how these headphones have presented themselves on other neutral sources. Concentrating on the planar only, the tonality of all vocalists was smooth yet detailed. The grain and sibilance recorded into songs like Orla Gartland's Why Am I Like This was clearly present on the planar, but not pushed forward or hidden. That experience was similar when I listened to Want You Back by Haim. In contrast, when I listened to these tracks on the 560S, female sibilance was accentuated and near my personal pain threshold. Male vocalists also did not seem changed from how I have heard them on the RME and the 789. On the Planar and S4X, male vocals were smooth and detailed. The 560S also rendered the male vocals fairly smoothly. Treble is neutral on the 390, as corroborated among all the test equipment. The Planar and 560S retained their neutral sound signatures in this frequency. The S4X had a slight increase in treble energy, just as I have heard it on other neutral sources. Treble-centric instruments seem to have accurate timbre. Generally, pianos sound full. Brass and horns retain their nasally characters. The 390 never added audible distortion or hiss. Indeed, the amp section was dead silent, even when the headphones are plugged in and no music was playing. I never heard any noise as I cranked the volume up to maximum. In short, the QA390 is a neutral source. It allows headphones to present their individual tonalities, good or bad. The 390 does not color the sound signature and does not seem to hinder the performance of any headphone that I tested. The QA390 has many batteries in parallel, totaling a capacity of 13,200 mAh. 
QLS says that the 390 has a battery life of 8 to 10 hours depending on use. The factors regarding battery drain include the file format you're using, connection type to your source, headphone impedance, and power output. In the last year, since I've had the 390, I have used it in various applications. I have taken it with me on road trips, to the office, and kept it as a desktop unit. I think I've played music equally from DAC mode and transport mode. Using at least CD quality FLAC files, the 390 has given me a full 6 hours with high impedance headphones such as the HD6XX and over 8 hours with low impedance headphones like the Sundara and S4X, all while the 390 was in high amplification mode. I have yet to achieve 10 hours, though I suppose it is possible. Interestingly, QLS says precisely what their battery testing methodology was, and I think it is worth quoting. QLS says that they achieved 8 to 10 hours with the following parameters. The 600 ohm Bayer Dynamic T1, volume set to 30 out of 100, digital output off, high gain and high voltage active, screen off, playing 16-bit 44.1 kHz WAV files. I think these testing parameters are very interesting and I'm assuming that QLS is being honest about it. You see, the vast majority of the time, when companies talk about battery lives of their products, they use the lowest common denominators in their testing. They will play MP3 files using low impedance headphones at low volume and proclaim that their devices have 10 hours or 15 hours of battery life. But with the QLS, their testing methodology apparently was more liberal. My real world tests suggest a slightly different experience than what QLS says. Like I said, I have yet to achieve 10 hours from the 390. However, I think that the 390 can be used for a full workday. One point that QLS emphasizes in the manual, and one which I should repeat here, is that they recommend discharging the 390's battery at least once per month. Basically, they say you should use your 390 at least once to low battery and then recharge. QLS says that this should be done to preserve battery longevity. As for charging, the QLS will quick charge over USB-C. I've done this a few times from nearly dead battery to full all within about 4 to 6 hours. Of course, you need to have a wall adapter capable of fast charging. Another worthwhile feature on the 390 is the charge toggle switch on the front. When you plug DC power into the 390, the device stops using batteries and switches to DC. If you want to use DC and charge the batteries at the same time, simply toggle the switch on the front. You can check the 390's power output specifications, that's fairly simple to do. Even on single-ended, the 390 has a ridiculous amount of power providing 180 milliwatts into 600 ohms. Overbalanced, the power output increases dramatically, at least for 300 and 600 ohm headphones. Over balance, the 390 provides 1.2 watts into 300 ohms, which is a swing of more than 800 milliwatts. For 600 ohms, the 390 has 720 milliwatts from balance, which is a swing of 540 milliwatts. All of this is theoretical until you put it to the test. To determine pure driving force, I listened to several headphones of various impedances and sensitivities. This included the Aventone Planar, Fostex T60RP, Modhouse Argon, and Bear Dynamic T1 second generation. For this test, I put the amp on super high gain and high voltage. On the Planar, which is 32 ohms, the headphone got very comfortably loud at 20 out of 100 volume steps. This was over 4.4mm balance connection. The drivers seem to perform at peak no differently than as they have performed on powerful amps like the 789 and 887. The T60RP is 50 ohms with a sensitivity of 92 decibels, which is to say that the headphone needs a lot of power. When connected to the single-ended connection, the T60RP became comfortably loud at step 40. The headphones seem to perform close to their full potential, however, I think that a more powerful amplifier does provide a slight increase in bass impact and clarity than what the 390 can provide to the T60. The Argon is the same driver as that of the T50 and the T60RP. Modhouse recommends at least 1 watt at 50 ohms. Connected to single-ended on the 390, the Argon became comfortably loud at step 45, but I think that the bass was loose. It was not as impactful as it is when the headphone is paired to more powerful amps like the Magni and the 789. 
Moreover, treble seemed to be reduced along with clarity. I connected the T1 with 4.4 mm balanced. The T1 became comfortably loud at step 36 and was at my personal pain threshold at step 50. By the way, if anyone is curious, I also listened to the T1 at volume step 30. This is the setting QLS used to determine battery life. At step 30, the T1 is certainly audible and probably comfortably within the safe listening levels. If you like to listen to your music loudly, then step 30 on the T1 is not going to make you happy. But if you listen to music at more reasonable, relaxed volumes, then the setting that QLS used is perfectly agreeable. Overall, it is clear that nearly any headphone will have plenty of power from the 390. Barring specialty headphones like the T50, T60, and their variants, the 390 provides ample power. Of course, if you modify the Argon or the T60RP for balanced connection, then you could take advantage of the 390's greater power output. That, I suspect, would change the performance of these headphones, and likely to a benefit of those headphone sound signature. Short of headphones that have a lust for raw power, I think any headphone you use will pair without issues to the QA390. QLS has a few ideas about how you could use the QA390. They talk about traveling audiophiles using this device, students, business professionals, and those who want to save money on electricity. Huh. Frankly, I think it's pretty humorous to read QLS trying to justify this $1,400 product. In my view, a lot of the selling points QLS makes don't sound very convincing. But having used this device for a year, I think I can probably envision practical uses. And if you'll indulge me for a few minutes, we can discuss how the QA390 might be useful. The argument that the 390 is for business professionals and travelers sounds pretty lame, but there is some truth to it. Instead of focusing on a wide swath of business professionals, I think that the 390 actually is for audio professionals who travel for business. If you're a recording artist, a sound engineer, or a distributor of hi-fi gear, you may travel to meet manufacturers and artists. If your job is to help record and master albums, or you set up studios for artists, then the QA390 might be an all-in-one kit in your bag. The 390 might also be for those who have a collection of headphones and like to take their power-hungry headphones on the go. And that's it. QLS lists a number of other justifications to purchase the 390, and I'm not convinced that those arguments will convince potential customers. For example, anyone who's prepared to pay $1,400 for this device is hardly worried about marginal electricity costs for their other gear. Several days ago, I posted one question. What is your ultimate DAP if size and weight were not factors? I had over 20 responses and there was a consistent theme. People want an all-in-one semi-portable device. They essentially want a phone that is also a high-resolution audio player that can drive high-impedance headphones and accepts large-capacity SD cards. Now, we have seen a few products try to achieve some of these requirements, like the Aston Kern Con, but the Con series are underpowered, just like every Aston Kern player. Fio, Shanling, and Hibby have their own versions of basically the same thing, a large DAP with touchscreen and some form of Android. However, all of these devices cost well over $1,000, and in the case of the Shanling M8 and Hibby R8, cost just under $2,000 each. There are lower priced, relatively speaking, products from these and other companies, of course, but none have the power output and feature set that the QA390 provides. But if we return to the original question that I posted and the answers that I got, even the QA390 is not really a direct response to those requirements. The 390 is by no means a portable player, at least not by the typical definition. The 390 is an all-in-one audio device, but not a pocket computer. So, anyone looking for a hyper souped up smartphone with killer DAP features, don't hold your breath. And anyone who is gravitating towards the $2,000 DAPs that I mentioned, and I can't imagine there are a lot of you, then the 390 might be worth a look before you go and click on the buy button on Hibby and Shanling's websites. When you're talking $1,400, you better have a gun pointed to your head before you click on the purchase button. How many times have we seen expensive products hype to no end? 
Astel and Kern are infamous for their crazy pricing. For example, a recent Astel and Kern release is the SE200, a DAP whose sole selling point is that it has two different DACs you can use at once, and it costs $1,800. Or there's the Shanling M8, a DAP that still does not have full-fledged Android, and one of its key features is interchangeable headphone jacks. You know, just in case you wanted to screw audio ports in and out whenever you wanted to use a different connection. Or there's the ever-increasing headphone war, where companies compete with each other to release the most ridiculous headphones for over $1,000 the Aria, LCD3, N4, Abyss, and Maze Empyrean are just a few examples of brain-dead pricing. Rational audiophiles know they can get great quality from far cheaper products. So how is it possible to justify the QA390? Well, it is unique. I do not know of any other product that does everything that the 390 does. The 390 is like the iFi IDSD Black Label, a basic DAP, and a stereo amplifier all combined into one. Its multiple headphone outputs would be interesting, but not enough by themselves to warrant the 390's expenditure. But it's more than the number of connections here. It's the total package that brings the uniqueness. The build is fantastic. The remote is the best I've ever used, although it could be improved with some basic labeling. The sound is neutral. The operating system is basic, but perfectly stable and quick. The 390 is powerful, and it is arguably movable, though not portable. The QA390 is a niche product. There's no doubt about that. The price tag is the first hurdle. I think most people are more interested in providing for their families than for paying for this device. But the niche market is really not that niche, let's be honest. Audio professionals, artists, and dedicated enthusiasts spend tons of money on gear every year. And for those people, the 390 offers a tremendous amount of features. This brings us to value. I am not trying to sell you on the QA390. In fact, I'm going to tell you not to buy it. If you're a budding audiophile, there's absolutely no reason to buy the 390. Save your money for things that actually matter. If you're a seasoned audiophile, a person who has used a few headphones and sources, then skip the 390. You don't need it. You're probably better off finding an affordable source and then experimenting with headphones from time to time. If you're a hobbyist, you probably won't gain a whole lot from the 390. You can't modify this device and spending this much money will simply deprive you of funds from much cheaper products that can be modified and tinkered with. So clearly, The QA390 is not for the majority of people. Ignore what QLS says. Students and business people have much better things to do with their money and their time than to spend it on this device. Here's the thing. I don't believe in end game components. There's always something newer or better around the corner. But there's also an upper limit as to how good something can actually be. Astle and Kern products are a perfect example of devices that pretend to offer value but really don't. Astro and Kern simply makes pretty DAPs using the same operating system. You know, the one where you can't download apps from the Play Store and whose power output is never published, probably because Astro and Kern players have very low power output. Think of all the uber expensive products coming out now. The M8, the SE200, the iFi IDSD Diablo, and many, many others seem totally unnecessary and unwarranted. But when you look at the QA390, you can see this product has things that none of the others do. Total usability. Speakers, headphones, DAP, DAC, amplifier, desktop, movable, powerful, all of these words apply to the 390. In the past, products were some of these, but never all. But the QA390 is. If you're in the group I mentioned a few minutes ago, I think you will easily disregard the 390. But if you're an enthusiast or audio professional, the 390 makes a lot of sense. You get everything in one package. The QA390 will not cure you of your shiny new product syndrome. If you're prone to get excited by and jump to purchase expensive, hyped gear, I doubt that the 390 will make you stop doing that. Nor do I propose that the 390 is the end game component that you need. Instead, I think you should look at your use scenario and ask yourself if the 390 is worth your money. 
the answer for the vast majority of people is no. But for a few people, the 390 might be very enticing. So while the 390 is not value per se, it still has value in proportion. In other words, while it is hard to justify the price, you can still justify the product. Here's my bottom line. If you're looking at the SE200, the M8, the M15, or any other similarly priced component, then stop and consider the QA390. Unless you absolutely want a pocket unit, the 390 offers a hell of a lot more than any of those other devices. For enthusiasts and audio professionals, the 390 is the product that does in fact offer a ton of features. For everybody else, it's simply another shiny piece of kit you can't and should not have because your wife will kill you if you found out that you bought it. <laughs>